So welcome everyone. <clears throat> and now I'm I'm skipping to my presenter self, and now I will have my presentation. Yes. So here you can see a goat looking very intensely at you. So I will begin this workshop with a short talk about why I think it's relevant that participatory epidemiology gets more influenced by and adapts to local contexts. This is a picture of Mama Pali, um, who is a woman who lives in, in the Eastern Cape in South Africa. And I lived in her house uh, during my field work uh, for my PhD. And my PhD thesis what was about um, smallholders in South Africa who were introduced to Bt maize, genetically modified maize, resistant to stem borers. And at that time, my name was Jacobson, as you can see. <coughs> so stem borers are a problem in this part of South Africa, and they, they lead to losses in maize production. Um, so, so the idea of this large-scale development program was that smallholders should benefit from the introduction of uh, Bt maize, which would reduce stem borer damage. So I performed long-term field work in these villages, uh, and I used uh, mixed qualitative methods, and I used many participatory tools. And in my thesis, I described the reasons for the failure of Bt maize to contribute to agricultural development in these villages. And I will not go so much into detail about the reasons for that in this presentation, but I will give you two examples from my field work to show the importance of taking the local perspective. And if you're more interested in the BT maze, you can read the thesis, and it's free online. This is not the picture from my field book, but I didn't have a picture of anyone plowing, so this was a, a free picture that I downloaded. From it looks, it looks like it's from some other country, maybe Ethiopia. I'm not sure. So the first example is that the South African Development Program, who introduced the BT maze to smallholder, uh, it emphasised the importance of uh, planting on time to get a decent harvest. But uh, the fields are located quite far away from people's houses and uh, people practice rain-fed farming, although sometimes they water their gardens, which is next to, a, next to the house. Um, <clears throat> so if the rains are late, people plant late. And also the poorer households who don't have any cattle on their own, they have to wait to borrow cattle or a tractor from, from someone else. And that means that most poorer households plant later than they want to very often. So I give you this example because I want to point out that if, if the reason that you plant late is not that you don't know when to plant, then it doesn't help to get the knowledge about when to plant. And also, the example also shows the, that people within villages are not all the same. Different people have different possibilities. Um, so we can't just look at people in one village as a, as a lump who has the same possibilities and ideas about how to do things. So this is a picture of a local maize variety that they call Kosa maize. And the, the, the cob on the, the covered cob, which is still growing, is a Bt maize. And <clears throat> the second example is about that smallholders didn't know that Bt maize was resistant to stem borers, which is quite a, a fatal problem in this development project. So the smallholders were informed that the beta maize was resistant to stem borers, but they were only informed like that, like I said it to you now, only in the form of oral information uh, without trying to engage in how smallholders understand or name stem borers um, or, or, and not with any other type of information than just talking. And many people didn't visit the meetings when, when this was told as well. And there are several reasons in the maize and stem borer interaction that makes it difficult for the smallholders to just comprehend what was said when they heard that the, stem the maize was stem borer resistant. For example, stem borers fly at night and they live inside stems. And many smallholders didn't always detect the insect damage. It was not always easy to to tell stem borer damage apart from, for example, loss of lot, lot, <laughs> lack of rain or nutrient deficiency. Also, the Bt maize was distributed in, in 10 kg bags, and inside these 10 kg bags you got a small bag. And this small bag was conventional maize seeds that th these seeds are supposed to be planted with the maize uh, for the purpose of delaying insect resistance. But 
uh, this wasn't communicated very well, and most people thought that this small bag was just a promotion. So that this small bag was also BTMAs, and many people gave that small bag to friends and neighbors who wanted to try BTMAs. So many people were planting maize that they thought were BTMAs, but it wasn't. And also, uh, people bought maize in the shops that they thought were BTMAs, but it wasn't. So all of this creates a lot of confusion and uh, makes it very difficult for smallholders to assess the new technology. And this is just something for you to rest your eyes on. So I give this example from about the beta maze because I see many similarities between how beta maze was introduced to smallholders and all the misunderstandings that it created and how smallholders are informed about animal illness and introduced to new medicines. So in summary, I showed with the example of the late plowing that we as development workers and researchers, we need to understand when something has to do with lack of knowledge and when practices that we think or interpret as suboptimal, they don't have to do with lack of knowledge, they have to do with something else. And often it has to do with something else. And then secondly, if it has to do with lack of knowledge, like in the example with the BTMase, when the smallholders actually didn't understand what the BTMase was resistant to, we need to try to find out how smallholders make sense of things in their context, because it doesn't it doesn't help then in this case to just say that uh, this maze is resistant to stem borers if people don't use that word for stem borers or if actually many people think that the larva and the moth are two different insects. So my point here is that it's important to, to engage in, in long-term field work and engage in local situations to understand, understand how to comprehend what, why people do what they do. So I wrote this paper with some colleagues in this room because I realized that many of the issues that I've pointed out in this presentation were rarely addressed in the literature that uses participatory epidemiology. Instead, from, from what I've read and, and uh, seen, participatory epidemiology has been used uh, or developed through fighting to be accepted as a real scientific methodology. And when it has done that, it has sort of focused very much on using participatory tools in ways that makes it possible to, to get uh, computable numbers out of the exercise. And it has done adapting the tools to the local context. So in my perspective, this risks losing the adaptability of the participatory tools, which I feel is central if we are to use participatory methods to actually make it easier for us to understand why animal owners do what they do in different contexts. So here is um, a summary of my key, the key points that I want to point out. So I would like to argue that we, show we should use participatory methods as a way to make epidemiology better at understanding local perspectives. And for this to be the case, we need to engage more in understanding the contexts in which we are working so we can't, we can't just take the participatory tools as fixed tools that you can use in any place. We need to see the tools as suggestions to, about what to do, that you need to adapt together with people in different places and use them in ways that make sense in that place. And this means that it will not be so easy to, <laughs> to, ma to make statistics out of this. But I think that that should not really be the core purpose. The, the purpose of the participatory tools should be to get knowledge about what is actually going on in a particular situation. So here are three key points. We need to understand the local context. We need to choose and adapt the participatory tools to the context. And we need to address local heterogeneity, power and conflict in the situations where we are working. Thank you.